Okay, good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Uh, my name is Zach Walker. I am the city manager for the city of Independence. And in accordance with section 8.2 of the city charter, it is my pleasure this evening to present to you the proposed budget for the fiscal year that would begin July 1, 2021 and run through June 30, 2022. Uh, the budget that I am presenting to you this year um, as a proposal totals three hundred and eleven million eight hundred eighty eight thousand one hundred ninety one dollars or a decrease of about five point one million dollars or approximately two percent uh, before I get into my presentation tonight I do want to um, express my sincere gratitude to our senior leadership team the finance department and our budget manager Erica Benitez uh, who decided to triple her efforts this year not only doing the budget but moving cross-country to independence during the pandemic so this is my second time seeing Erica in person so welcome to City Hall <laughs> can't talk about the budget without very quickly talking about COVID-19 uh, Last year, of course, this was thrust upon us right as we were concluding uh, our budget development process. Uh, we worked together, um, both as council and staff, to navigate those waters. Uh, I am pleased to let you know that the council's uh, authorization of the $25 million line of credit was not needed, as you've now rescinded that ordinance. And the $1.5 million COVID reserve also didn't come into play through strong fiscal management we were able to navigate those waters within our existing operating and capital budgets, not needing either a reserve fund to make ends meet during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. But this is still a part of our daily life. Um, as of um, last week, there are about 32 and a half million confirmed cases that have occurred within the United States over the course of the last year or so. Um, but things have started to turn. The United States is vaccinating about 3 million people per day. Um, Health officials now estimate that herd immunity may be achieved as early as mid-July. The most optimistic scenarios before had that as late fall, sometime in September. Uh, so that appears to be accelerating forward. Um, I saw statistics today from the governor's office that 80% of Missourians now live within five miles of access to a vaccination clinic. Um, that said, about 34% of Missourians have received uh, their, at least their first dose of the vaccine. So we are seeing some reduction in demand. Um, that, that popularity um, has started to wane after the initial surge. Uh, and some concerns do exist about bottlenecks, bottlenecks in production. As you probably saw, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was temporarily delayed. Um, so that kind of presents a little uncertainty about where we go with potential variants and other spikes down the road, something we have to at least keep in the back of our mind. But a lot of good news again, 6.6% um, positivity rate, way down from the 25 to 30% that we saw back uh, late last fall and earlier this winter. On top of that, um, there has been a tremendous infusion of federal fiscal stimulus into the economy. Most recently, the American Rescue Plan, or ARP as it's known, uh, has provided $1.9 trillion of stimulus both to um, citizens as well as to our um, uh, municipalities, local and, and state governments. Congress is in the midst of debating the Build Back Better program, which is an infrastructure package, um, anticipated timeline of later this year uh, when that might be adopted, but two t trillion dollars for infrastructure and another trillion in social benefits over the next 10 years. Uh, so again, tremendous amount of stimulus been pumped into the economy which has certainly helped our position here in Independence as well. You can find a lot of different economists talking about a lot of different um, economic forecasts about how the recovery is going. The most common one I hear these days is a K-shaped recovery. And what that refers to is that for folks who are um, in an you know, upper middle income and above bracket, by and large the economy has recovered for them. Um, almost all but one or two percent of the jobs that were lost at $60,000 and above have been recovered. The folks making $27,000 and less, that has not quite recovered yet. In fact, um, there's still 28% less jobs in that uh, uh, fiscal bracket than there was a year ago. So um, folks who are in the lower incomes are certainly still feeling the impacts of the, of the economic downturn more so uh, than folks in the upper end. Here's a quick look at unemployment. This continues to overshadow our financial position. 
Uh, initial unemployment claims are beginning to tick down quite rapidly. Um, they are still more than double the pre-pandemic levels, but they are starting to come back down. Um, but there's still quite a bit of slack in the labor market. Um, continued claims uh, are still near $4 million. I know that's something, you know, Council Member Steinmeier pointed out in one of our budget presentations last year. That's that continued unemployment rate. That's, that's something to be mindful of. Um, if we include those discouraged workers and the underemployed, those who are working part-time but want full-time employment, that unemployment rate is 75% higher uh, than the official rate. So there's two different ways to look at this. We could take a pessimistic look at our economic position, or the glass half empty, if you will. Um, some things, that if you're um, slanted towards the, the negative, things that you could use to bolster your argument. Um, vaccine demand is, as I mentioned, reducing. Uh, we've kind of vaccinated the folks who seem to have that initial desire. Those who are remaining may have some sort of hesitancy about becoming vaccinated, so we may have hit that. Um, higher end of folks who are seeking to become vaccinated. Again, the disruption in the distribution certainly presents some issues. Potentially some talk among um, public health officials about resurgent in viruses and variants that may come about. Will that affect the economy? We don't know, but it's something to be mindful of. Um, inflation fears and higher interest rates. This is something that the uh, um, Treasury Chair was speaking to the other day, that inflation may be ticking higher and we may have to look at raising the interest rates to keep up with, with potential inflation. Um, and then employment recovery, how quickly is that happening? There are some economists who take a pessimistic viewpoint and believe this may not occur until at least the second half of this decade, um, the 20s as they are. Regionally, uh, that unemployment rate is still one and a half percent above the pre-recession levels. Um, and then a couple of the key indicators that we look at, consumer spending still down 24% compared to January 2020, and small businesses that are open, 26% less, meaning there's been a 26% reduction in the number of small businesses here within our region. We could choose to be optimistic about the economy as well, though. There's enough data to support that viewpoint. Again, if herd immunity is achieved sooner than we anticipated, uh, that pent-up demand, um, I put for home ownership here, but really we're seeing that across the board for things like cars, for things like uh, appliances for home repairs. This uh, tremendous amount of fiscal stimulus is providing people the opportunity to make those sort of investments in their personal lives uh, and, and there's certainly capital and cash to be spent. Um, again, a lot of people have more savings because they haven't been able to do things like travel and other discretionary uh, activities, so a huge boost of consumer spending uh, may lay right around the corner. In that case, the recovery, some economists would tell you, could begin as early uh, as the second quarter of this year, uh, and I think there are certainly signs of that. Regionally, um, good news, um, we've recovered nearly three quarters of the 143,000 jobs that we lost last year. That unemployment rate regionally is 1.3% below the U.S. average, so our economy regionally is stronger than the United States national average. Job postings have increased 32% compared to uh, January of 2020. And our recovery is so much faster than what we saw in the Great Recession of 2020, probably in part due to the tremendous amount of fiscal stimulus, but so far economic indicators uh, are projecting that our recovery is three times faster than what we saw with the Great Recession. Very quickly with Missouri, um, again, this is some good news, bad news juxtaposition for you. Tourism, which is certainly a big part of the Missouri economy, this has taken a very hard hit. Um, tourism is a nearly $18 billion industry within the state of Missouri, but that economic impact fell to a 10-year low of 14.5 million uh, in 2020, and the occupancy rates for hotel has exceeded 50% over the past five weeks, which isn't great, but compared to 20% one year ago, it's looking a lot better. Missouri economy is rebounding better than our peers nationwide in terms of the employment and gross domestic product. Uh, the state is heavily reliant on the economies of the two large metros, and I must say the Kansas City metro is doing far better than the metro on the east side of the state. Um, the uncertainty, however, around the post-COVID economy leaves a bit of uncertainty about where the economy will shake out, but Missouri's key industries, things like manufacturing, technology, entrepreneurship, 
have us on some solid ground uh, for economic recovery in the near term. So this budget, with that backdrop, again, mm -hmm. against COVID, against unemployment versus employment and versus consumer spending, is still b um, based upon and has as its foundation independence for all. Uh, the five-year strategic plan that was recently readopted by the City Council in March of 2021 with our key um, goals of reducing crime and disorder, reducing blight, stabilizing and revitalizing neighborhoods, communicating more effectively, and a new priority for this year, enhancing public health, apropos given the past year that we've had. So the budget that I am submitting to the council tonight for fiscal year 21-22 is a hybrid of all of these different economic factors and using the term cautious optimism. Um, reasons to be optimistic, reasons to be pessimistic, we are taking a cautiously optimistic approach. Four key uh, principles and philosophies driving this budget. We have conservatively estimated our revenues. Um, certainly there are good positive signs out there but it, I would rather be on the side of being overly surprised instead of overly shocked about where the revenues come in. So they are based on those historical trends with some of the COVID overlay brought in, uh, so conservatively estimating those revenues. We are accurately budgeting for all known expenditures. All of our positions in this budget are fully funded, our known um, overtime costs, our known operating expenditures, all of those things that we know we have accurately budgeted for uh, within this budget. And I do give a lot of credit to our, our budget team who has worked very hard to calculate and track those expenditures so we could account for those. We have addressed the City Council's strategic priorities um, as outlined in Independence for All and as verified by our citizens in the citizen survey that we did last <coughs> fall. Um, many of the key priorities, in fact, I think all of the key priorities that were brought to light by the Council uh, are funded in some form or fashion in this proposed budget. And as you will see, we are making strategic use of one-time revenues to further navigate that economic uncertainty. Um, certainly provides us a bridge. We hope a bridge to a more stable place, but it is a, a transition year and one that makes uh, generous use of one-time revenues. So again, the proposed budget, $336 million, um, up 7% over the previous year. That was reduced um, significantly because of COVID-19. Um, so though that 7% number looks big, that's because we're not only acclimating for um, our new expenditures, but then the catch up from the costs that were reduced because of COVID. Again, fully funding all of the positions in the budget. None of this, you know, vacant, but frozen or you know, exists, but isn't funded um, stuff. These, these positions that you see are all fully funded in the budget. And again, we do not uh, make any use of those pooled funds from the interfund loan. So there is no need for the half million dollar interest repayment that was going to be needed for the next five years. Some key pressure points that I'd like to highlight in this budget, um, workers comp charge increases. We are getting a better handle on our workers comp program, but workers comp works on a rolling um, several year average. So because we've incurred costs um, from you know, protecting our workforce, uh, we do have about a million dollars of cost increase associated with work comp in there to help the work comp fund. Um, health insurance is a cost that continues to go up and a lot of credit goes to our Stay Well Advisory Committee who's put in a tremendous amount of work, uh, co-chaired by Mike Veet and Cindy Culp. Uh, they have worked with our new insurance advisor, CBiz, to identify the need for a 15% uh, in premium increase. 10% of that funded in this budget and then about 1.8 million coming from those American Rescue Plan dollars that I proposed to you. Retiree health insurance, that continues to be a big success story for us. A $120 million reduction in our post-employment benefits liability. I only bring this to bear tonight to point out to you that it will take time to fully realize the benefit of the leadership that the council a few years ago um, in concert with our retiree group uh, that is still a $6.2 million expenditure in our budget. Over time, um, we'll see the full benefit of that kick in. Um, so it takes time to realize that full benefit, but it is a path that we are well on now and, and something we can continue to feel good about. The ERP fund, this is the implementation of MUNIS, which I know the Audit and Finance Committee has um, been very diligent about ensuring it's completed this year. Uh, there are cost increases in there to help that get across the finish line. 
We have our state mandated premium increase for loggers in here, so that's a 1% increase. Again, we're part of a statewide consortium to fund our employee pension, which is what this loggers is. Um, that's going to look a little bit larger in your budget, closer to 13%. The actual increase is 1%, but the way we are recording it with all of the other ancillary costs like overtime, et cetera, make it look larger than it truly is, but I just I wanted to highlight that for the council. Um, I know public safety is a massive priority for this council and the community. The contractually obligated uh, pay, uh, salary, and benefit increases are in here, which we hope will further aid in our recruitment and retention efforts. That's about a one and a half million dollar increase. And then this is the final year of those COVID CDBG funds to help support our transit operations. The council will recall from last year Transit's a very highly subsidized operation in our city. We're making use of the CDBG funds to help support that subsidy for a very critical service for some of the more vulnerable in our community. Very quickly, uh, just a, a general fund overview. Um, as you'll see here in just a few moments, um, this is the first year that a budget is submitted to this council that has the waterfall from Proposition P or the use tax in that. So the general fund has $448,000 of new revenue from the Proposition P uh, waterfall. That brings about um, a 1.5% increase in sales tax revenue. However, as we've talked about for several years, the traditional ways that local government, at least in independence, have been funded are continuing to erode. And you're going to continue to see decreases in your cable and television franchise fees, as well as your fine and court costs uh, from municipal court. As I mentioned earlier, this budget does make generous use of the uh, federal stimulus dollars. Um, an allowable use of those is revenue replacement. So between um, the health insurance costs and the general fund shortfall, there's $4.172 million of federal ARP dollars being used. Um, as you'll talk about here in just a minute, this gives us a year to both see how does the economy continue to shake out in a COVID, partially post-COVID world, but also for this leadership team and this council to continue working on both managing our ongoing expenditures and finding ways to attract new revenue growth into this city. Um, I'm proud of the work we've done to control our costs and even cut our expenses over the last few years. I do not believe we can continue cutting our way to prosperity though, and I think revenue growth is going to be especially critical over the course of the next two months, or t uh, 12 months, unless we want to have to face that uh, three plus million dollar shortfall this time next year. On the expenditure side with the general fund, that's about $78 million or an increase of 5.3% over last year. Primarily that's due to those pressure points on my last slide, things like workers comp, uh, overtime, fully funding our known expenditures. Um, notable changes, $295,000 for our street light consumption costs. These, this has been a big issue for our Public Utility Advisory Board, making sure that our actual streetlight costs are reflected in the budget. Um, I don't know if my friend Bob Sorensen from Loggers is here tonight, but I would like to highlight for our retirees that the management uh, advisory fees for our um, uh, 457 plan, those costs are fully budgeted in here. Uh, so I know that was something that was concerning for the retirees last year. We've got that in here. Uh, an innovative idea that I'd like to credit our police department with, converting six police officer position to cadets. Um, you have to be a certain age to um, become a certified police officer in the state of Missouri. Uh, this will allow folks to qualify as a cadet, um, get into the program, um, start working their way through the academy, uh, gets um, potential new recruits into our department and familiar with our staff so that hopefully by the time they graduate the academy, uh, they are not only ready to hit the street, but they're committed to the city of independence and not a different firm that may have poached them in the time that they were in the academy. I know it was a priority of the council by resolution, um, I believe sponsored by council member Stewart to fund a neighborhood services manager for proactive code enforcement. That has been funded in here. Last year after we were unable to do any across the board wage increases, we have the 2% across the board for all of our non-represented employees. <coughs> Um, which conversely matches the same amount that has been um, negotiated uh, with, with those groups who have their contractual obligations for this coming fiscal year. That certainly helps both with retention of our workforce as well as morale. And then finally, last year we had a $1.5 million COVID contingency. This year I've put in just 
over $300,000. Mostly this was if um, unknown expenses related to COVID or some surprise revenue fell through, we would have a little bit of a cushion. That should show that again, we believe we're starting to turn the corner economically, at least in terms of COVID. Um, but I still think it's important to have a little bit of a contingency to help us should unforeseen issues uh, arise. This is a graph that shows our general fund fund balance. By a council resolution, we should try to be hitting 16% of revenue. The proposed budget has that at 8.7%. I know that doesn't sound great, but just a few years ago, that number was closer to 2%. Um, so over the last few years, we have steadily climbed our way to where we're just shy of 9% now. However, if we don't address some of those structural issues that I uh, referenced earlier, you can see that that fund balance would dip to about 1.9 million next year and then run negative in fiscal year 23, 24. So I put this in here to just highlight that this is the important sense of urgency that we should have for implementing these uh, um, revenue growth and, and cost management strategies heading into the next few fiscal years. As I mentioned, this is the first year where we'll see the waterfall of the use tax or Proposition P. Um, $44.5 million subject to the online sales tax. And because we are now able to fully fund the animal shelter obligation, which is $762,000, as well as the funding for the up to 30 new police officers, which is just slightly over $3 million, the total revenue from all funds is $4.8 million, uh, we're estimating. So you can see where we believe all of our sales taxes will benefit with the waterfall uh, in the year ahead. Very remarkable. Um, did not expect this to happen this fast and certainly helps our budget situation um, in the year ahead. So this just reflects where our sales tax growth is at. Again, it looks partially better because of the you know, suppression from COVID last year, but it's really driven by the fact that we have that um, revenue growth because of Proposition P uh, in the waterfall. This is the first year where we will have the Health and Animal Services Department. Um, the council gave staff direction to go pursue um, recertification of a local public health agency. Um, working with our uh, legislators and our lobbyists in Jefferson City, we were able to achieve that recognition from the state. So this budget has the reestablishment of the Independence Health Department with the baseline funding in there. We hope that additional grant dollars will come in future years from the state, but we don't have those in here yet because we don't know that for certain. So because of that, we are again using some of those American Recovery Plan dollars to uh, help prop up this budget. $150,000 for this year and $150,000 for next year. Um, we will need those long-term resources beyond those next two years though, and that's where we'll work with our state delegation and our lobbyists to try to secure those, those grant dollars. We're proposing combining Animal Services Department with this new health department as it was before we folded the um, or reorganized the health department a few years ago. Uh, so this just brings back, by and large, that same model that we had prior to 2018. Um, I just want to brag on our newly established health department for just a moment. In the first two months of having the COVID-19 clinic open, they've delivered over 15,000 doses of the vaccine um, at the clinic at the Independence Center. Uh, 10,000 of those just in the last few weeks of uh, April. Uh, so they have been very busy out there and certainly made life-changing impact on the independence community. We need to highlight the enterprise funds, which are the water, wastewater, and electric utility funds. Um, I am forecasting limited revenue growth due to COVID-19 and limited expansion. Um, you know, both our industry growth and our residential growth remain stagnant. Um, and then with people moving to more energy efficient practices in their homes and businesses, we just don't forecast um, tremendous revenue growth in, across the three utilities. So we are proposing a strategic drawdown from the fund balances in the sewer and water funds. Per the cash resiliency policies, um, we will be spending down some of those um, excess reserves to support operations and capital for the sewer and water funds. And then careful strategic management of power and light uh, over the course of the next year. Um, that fund is made whole with its operating expenses. It is the capital expenses uh, where we are um, beyond what our revenues are bringing in. So we are using or proposing to use our reserves to help fund those capital projects. But throughout the course of the fiscal year, we'll be monitoring our revenues and only bringing those projects to the council at the time we either feel they're necessary and urgent 
or at the times that we feel like revenue is sufficient to support those projects. So that will be very strategic month-to-month -month management of the uh, electric utility. We will need to continue monitoring our operating expenses as well. I know we've discussed with the council the need to do some sort of a staffing plan and review at Power and Light. We are in the midst of that. Just takes a little longer to do that when we're doing that in-house. So we're working our way through that and we'll plan to um, continue making uh, adjustments to our operating expenses uh, via, via the staffing plan as the fiscal year moves on. But a couple of highlights for you. Um, the water fund, we're going to accelerate our main replacement program, which will help ensure the reliability and stability of our water main transmission and distribution system for years to come. If you saw what Kansas City's experienced the last few years with their main breaks and then the associated cost increase, we're trying to stay ahead of that. Um, the sewer fund, many of our uh, Eastern Independence residents are actually under the governance of the Little Blue Valley Sewer District. They have a $450,000 rate increase that we have to adjust for, so that is uh, funded in this budget. And then uh, $184,000 for three FTEs for an infiltration project, which will help with our environmental compliance in the sewer utility. So just looking ahead, the final slide here, it's very important that we continue to build a financially sustainable budget. We cannot really begin to attack our other strategic priorities until we know that our finances are stable. I've identified five options of what we can do over the course of the next year and beyond. There may be other ideas that come to light, but we'll need to do either one or some combination of these to continue managing our financial position. We're going to have to make strategic changes to the legacy expenditures that we have that are growing at unsustainable rates. For example, our health benefits. Um, health insurance is a very important issue for our city, for our employees. Um, but every organization, public and private sector, is being faced with astronomical increases in their health insurance costs. That is a cost that we're going to have to figure out how to manage so we can have the resources to uh, provide services for our citizens as well. Uh, the leave payouts, the sick leave, vacation leave, uh, these are legacy expenses that um, as long-term tenured employees retire, these are costs that we have to incur, so they're ones we're going to have to figure out how to manage through to meet our obligations. and then other benefit costs that, that are associated with employment at the city as well. We'll figure out attracting and retaining the kind of industry that meets market demand. I saw today that the cities that are coming back strongest from the, econ uh, the economic uh, downturn are those cities that were facing uh, technology, entrepreneurial, and manufacturing uh, investments in their city. Cities like Des Moines and Denver and, and some of those other cities that come to mind um, we need to begin attracting those kind of employers to our city and transition away from a retail and service sector strategy for economic development and towards the kind of jobs that will provide employment for our residents and economic development uh, in our community. That's how we'll get revenue and rooftops in our city. Um, we may need to pursue revenue growth through ballot initiatives, things like Senator Rizzo's fire sales tax initiative or other levy opportunities that may exist. Those are conversations that we should have with this council and with our community. We need to evaluate our citizen demand for services and strategically decide where we should invest our resources in a way that they align with that demand for services. Uh, there are places in this organization where I think resources are far short of the demand for service and there are places where resources uh, exceed the demand for service and it's our responsibility as staff to bring that to you through uh, performance data so that you can make those kind of decisions uh, as a governing body. And then an option, certainly not one I would recommend, is making those across the board reductions to the already meager workforce, uh, which is not going to be good. That is going to strain our ability to provide the services in a community where we're already strained to do that. So I, I think we all know we need to focus on those revenue growth and strategic cost containment uh, opportunities. So with that, it has been my pleasure to work with our staff over the last few months developing this budget getting the strategic input from this council. Uh, we will be available for the next 45 days um, to answer questions leading up to the June 21st consideration of adoption of the budget. So with that, Madam Mayor, I will answer any questions we have tonight. Okay, thank you, Mr. City Manager.